Hey everybody, this video is called Sacrifice and Food, and tonight we're going to continue our pass-through study here in the book of Leviticus. We're looking at chapter 17, where we're going to look at the laws regarding sacrifice and food, as well as the topic of consuming blood. So let's look at chapter 17, starting with verse 1 through 4. It's a very short chapter, so it should not be a very long video, but... It says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron, to his sons, and to all the children of Israel, and say to them, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded, saying, Whatever man of the house of Israel who kills an ox or a lamb or a goat in the camp or who kills it outside the camp and does not bring it to the door of the tabernacle of meeting to offer an offering to the Lord, before the tabernacle of the Lord, the guilt of the bloodshed should shall be imputed to that man. And he has shed blood, and that man shall be cut off from among the people. So from this point on through chapter like 27, the next 10 chapters, you're going to see the guidelines that give for practical holiness detailed. And holiness issues that pertain to the individuals are listed and miscellaneous laws relating to sacrifice are discussed here. And you're going to see sexual behavior and so many other topics in the chapters coming up for the next couple weeks. And an unauthorized sacrifice could result in death. And there, they were to be apart from the pagan world. And they were not to sacrifice the way that the world did. But they were to sacrifice at the door of the tabernacle. In verses 5 through 9... It says, To the end that the children of Israel may bring their sacrifices, which they offer in the open field, that they may bring them to the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting, to the priest, and offer them as peace offerings to the Lord. And the priest shall sprinkle the blood on the altar of the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting, and burn the fat for a sweet aroma to the Lord. They shall no more offer their sacrifices to demons after whom they have played heart the harlot. This shall be a statute forever for them throughout their generations. And you shall say to them, whatever man of the house of Israel or of the strangers who dwell among you, whoever who offers a burnt offering or sacrifice and does not bring it to the door of the tabernacle of meeting to offer it to the Lord, that man shall be cut off from among his people. So the Lord here is warning against the sacrifice taking place anywhere other than the door of the tabernacle of Meton. And to sacrifice before pagans' gods were to worship demons. And if you didn't, if you didn't bring your sacrifice the way that God has called for, you were really given to demons. And the demonic background of sacrifice justified this severe punishment of excommunication of open idolatry. In verse uh, 10 through 12 here says, And whatever man of the house of Israel or of the strangers who dwell among you who eats any blood, I will set my face against that person who eats blood and will cut him off from among his people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Therefore I said to the children of Israel, No one among you shall eat blood, nor shall any stranger who dwells among you eat blood. So we see warnings here on the misuse of blood issued. And blood carries life-sustaining elements to all parts of the body. All parts of the body contain Blood. Therefore, it represents the essence of life. And likewise, the shedding of blood also represents the shedding of life and death. And we know Jesus shed his blood when he was being crucified and hung on that cross. And since blood contains the life, it is sacred to God. And that's why blood was to not be consumed. And the shed blood from a substitute atones for or covers the sinner who is then allowed to live. And all life belongs to God. So to eat blood was to profane it. And many pagan rituals celebrate drinking blood. And that was, you know, another part of why God has called for 
not consuming blood because God was calling Israel to be separate, to be holy from the world around them. In verse uh, 13 through 16, it says, Whatever man of the children of Israel or of the strangers who dwell among you, who hunts and catches any animal or bird that may be eaten, he shall pour out its blood and cover it with dust. For it is the life of all flesh. Its blood sustains its life. Therefore I said to the children of Israel, You should not eat the blood of any flesh, for the life of all flesh is its blood. Whoever eats it shall be cut off. And every person who eats what died naturally or what was torn by beasts, whether he is a native of your own country or a stranger, he shall, wa he shall both wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. Then he shall be clean. But if he does not wash them or bathe his body, then he shall bear his guilt. So that's a wrap up for the chapter right there. But it was customary with heathen hunters when they killed any game to pour out the blood as an offering to the God of the hunt. And the Israelites were instructed by these directives in verses 13 through 16. And they were banned from the superstitious acts of this idolatry. And this cleansing was necessary because these animals would have blood, wouldn't have had the blood drained properly. And the blood was to be poured out on the ground and covered with dust. And if one came upon an animal that did not, that uh, died naturally like roadkill, one could eat of it as good meat shouldn't go to waste. So roadkill was acceptable in consuming. And the person who ate it, though, was considered ceremonially unclean, and they needed washing. And to wrap up the chapter here, we looked at the prohibition of sacrifice outside of the tabernacle and that sacrifices as we see throughout exodus were to be carried out by the appointed priests and idolatry essentially is the given to demons still today you know when we are given to idols and we're given things you know that don't glorify god you're really giving them to the demonic world and let's look at first corinthians chapter 10 verse 20 and 21 and the apostle paul says this he says rather that the things which the gentiles sacrifice they sacrifice to demons and not to god and i do not want you to have worship with demons you cannot drink the cup of the lord and the cup of demons you cannot partake of the lord's table and of the table of demons or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we, a, are we stronger than he? So all worship that is not directed toward God is directed toward the devil and his, and his uh, demons. And think about that for a moment. But we also look at the prohibition against eating blood and consuming blood. And they were taught how to respect God's command in regards to the blood and if the blood of the animal should be respected here how much uh, we hire to respect the blood that Jesus has shed for us and let's look at Hebrews chapter 10 verse 28 and 29 it says here by the writer of Hebrews anyone who has rejected Moses law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? So chapter 10 here, it's a very common passage in verses uh, 26 through 30 here. People use it to teach loss of salvation, and they, you know, they'll use these verses and be like, see, you can trample the blood, you can fall out of grace, and all that. But I don't believe that these verses are warning against losing salvation, and there's many other passages. If this is teaching losing salvation, then the Bible has contradictions, and we're wasting our time here. But the writer of Hebrews is encouraging perseverance as works is evidence of the transformation that is a result of 
salvation. And, you know, I'm one that is anti-easy believism. I don't believe people can just say a prayer and live on a prayer. I believe that one has to be born again, as John chapter 3 tells us. And for, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that we become a new creature. So we don't do works to be saved. And if you saw my post yesterday, I post on uh, Galatians chapter 2, where the Apostle Paul speaks of justification by faith alone, not through works. But I do believe, you know, that when we come to Christ, that we are going to follow Christ. We're going to want to be in Christ. We're going to seek to be holy as God is holy, as even First Peter chapter 1 verse 13, I believe, says, you know, he, they, he quote, be holy as I am holy. You know, we are called as Christians to be set apart for God. So I hope you think about that this evening. And, you know, holy, some people hate the word holy, but it means pretty much to be separate unto God. And we know that many spots in the scripture tells us to not be of this world, to separate ourselves unto God. So we'll wrap this up right here. And tomorrow night, we're going to continue in Leviticus chapter 18, where we're going to look at the laws of sexual behavior. And let me just warn you ahead of time, I'm not going to water it down for 2021 version. I'm not going to water it down for the American culture or any of the other liberal ideal beliefs. I'm going to, you know, speak what the Bible says exactly about sexual behavior. So tune in if you want to hear that. If not, just scroll on by. So have a great rest of your night. God bless.